Bierfeld. I'm the Community Education Director for the Moorhead Area Public Schools. We're delighted to be able to bring you this introduction to some of your neighbors, people who've chosen to move to the Midwest and to live in the Fargo-Moorhead area and make this place their home. They have a message for all of us that I think will be inspiring and enlightening, and I know I learned a lot just listening to them. We're grateful for the Walmart Corporation for giving us a grant to be able to do this project and hope you enjoy learning about your neighbors. My name is Abdi Osman, and people usually call me Abdi. That's my first name, and my last name is Osman. So um, originally, I came from I was born in Somalia, um, and uh, before the civil war in Somalia, which started around 1990s, um, my parents moved from uh, Somalia due to the civil war, and then they came all the way to a neighboring country called Kenya. So they started living in a refugee camp, and uh, I grew up in a refugee camp until I did my uh, early childhood education like until my primary education in, in the refugee camp and then I also finished my high school in a refugee camp so so that's where we call it the dub so that's the largest refugee camp in the world in terms of community wise people who are there are v it's a very diversified area it's like people around Eastern Africa are, are always there, and they, 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 they predominantly uh, people or society is Somalis. So because Somalia is the neighboring country, to, it's, it locates in the northeastern part of Kenya, which is inhabited by Somalis. So, and then it extends all the way to the other parts of Somalia, and people started living there. So we're talking about like 600, more than 600,000 people in three different areas. So and then we have like not only Somalis, but we have people from Sudan, usually the South Sudan, and then we have people from Ethiopia, then we have people from Congo, we have people from Rwanda, we have people from Burundi, we have people, the ripples from, from Uganda too. So all these groups are, are, are there. So either somebody's there because he left his country because of a civil war, or which, which was instability, and then or he left there because of political issues, like people seek uh, refugee, being a refugee because they are seeking like political asylum. So, so we have like that diversified people. So, and then it looks like a normal area where you have like UNHCR is just taking care of people, but we have also some other organizations like Save the Children. So uh, there are very many like CARE, so there are very many organizations. And, uh, and then in that now, people take it like, you know, some, some, some places, if you, if you go there, you feel this is like a normal village, which is not. But in terms of when you're youth and you, you need really like youth development, it's really very rare for you to get whatever you want. You know, you cannot pursue your goal because you have limited resources and then you cannot go out to other parts of Kenya. And then it's not easy to go to other parts of Kenya because they are looking for like identification cards so that you're co and then you're considered to be a refugee and you have to be in the camp, you know, unless you want to go to this city and then you claim to be like an up and refugee, you know, which, which is very hard for you to, to go to even because there are roadblocks all the over and police will check you and everything. So that's, that's where I started life, and uh, I lived there for like 20 years, you know, in a refugee camp. I finished my high school. Then I got a job uh, after my high school. With, I started like a research associate and doing like some data collection, and then with Save the Children. So it was Save the Children, which is a child protection organization. So then I started now as a, then they trained me as a child protection trainer. So I started now training people on what are child rights, what do, what do, what are the rights of our children. Though the in terms of the recreation activities which are available, it's also very hard. So Save the Children uh, came up with a child friendly center. They call it CFS Child Friendly Center, where children can be like parents can can take their children there. They can play. They have some ready materials, you know. So a, a sort a sort of recreation activity for children. And if a parent wants to go and look for some sort of work, then they can leave their child there. So just like children at the age of seven years and even younger than at three, four. So so basically that's that's where I worked for some time. I worked with them for two years. Then after that, then I wanted to pursue my my goals because I wanted to go to college. So I I went out. 
I tried hard on my own. Then I went from the refugee camp to the capital city of Kenya, which was in Nairobi. So in Nairobi, then it's, it's like, you know, it's like for you leaving a refugee camp and going to a city where you have no relative. It's like you don't know any person. It's a very big city. It's like you don't know where to start life. And whatever I had was just around 36,000 Kenyan shillings, which is equivalent to $320. And, and just like I traveled there, I went there. Then I got some people I know, you know, and uh, some friends. They live in a small room and they share, like, there are five of them living in that room. Like, they are, all of them are boys. So, so and then I joined them, you know. I, I started, like, being the rent from my side. So, they, like, in terms of what they share, they pay, like, it's, it's, it's like 3,000 Kenyan shilling, which is equivalent to at this currency. You now it's like f $50, you know. And that $50, then I may pay, like, if you share with five, and it's like $10 a month. So that's, that's how I started now living. And whatever I had, I didn't use the, all those money. I went to, I went, my reason, the reason why I moved to the city was I wanted to go to college. And uh, I started going to college. I paid almost half of whatever I had, which is $300, more than $160 to college, just for admission and everything. Then I started my first semester. As I was there, then, you know, one thing I learned was when I moved to a city, I learned how to live in hardship. Though I grew up in a refugee camp, one thing I learned, like, I wasn't like a spendthrift. I wasn't paying everything I made. You know, I, I made it one time a day and have, like, some snacks in the, uh, at night. And that might be the entire food I had, like, an entire 24 hours. And that made me to survive, like, to sacrifice whatever I had. And I don't used to go to the bigger restaurants just to eat. I used to go to small, small local areas. Just instead of paying, five, I mean, like, one dollar, I pay, like, 0 0.5 dollars just to buy whatever I want that day so that's that's how I survived and uh, I like when I stayed there for three months then I got like uh, a local college which had some English classes and uh, one thing I had was I, I went to the English program then it was over but they had certification from a uh, UK uh, uh, a college by the name City and Girls London Institute it's an English, it's they over English internationally and then they have certifications. So I went through a program too. I had a friend who, they said like, we can give you like a scholarship sort of program and then once you're trained, then you can be a, one of the tutors. Mm -hmm. So that's how I went in. Then in three months, I was able to do like preliminary level, which is the first level. Then I was able to do the second level and the third level in three months. So I attend all the exams and I, and I pass well. So then they said, like, Abdi, then we are the guy we are looking for, so you can start teaching. So I started, like, uh, a salary of, like, $70 a month, you know. Then that's how I survived. So out of that $70, then I can use, like, uh, $30, and the other $40 I pay with college. So that's how I finished my first associate's degree in social work. And with my experience working with uh, organizations like Save the Children, then I, I, I didn't give up working with people. So I continued, and uh, with the, when I was still there, then I got like some other local organizations, and I worked with them frontierly on my weekends. And, and then after I finished my associate, then I got a job. Now I paid a job with $300 a month. So then that's now where I started life. I worked with them for another two years. Then I got another organization, now a pair organization, which now they look like more like an internationally. So the, that, that now took me back to where I came from before, which was in Somalia. So living in Kenya, but this time, this organization wanted someone who can work with them in Somalia and Kenya, who can speak Swahili, who can speak Somali, or all the dialects of Somali. So the good thing about me is like, I speak Somali, but the two dialects, there's the Mai and there's Maha, which is the two dialects of Somali. So I speak both of them. So, and then again, I also speak Swahili. So this has given me like more chance there. And then with my, with my background in, in social work, this was the other opportunity, you know. So I went back to Somalia. I traveled back to Somalia, the different part of Somalia. I worked with people. And uh, that now has opened doors for me. So I, people like started learning me, you know, I started growing. And uh, from a child protection perspective, then I moved to working with people in terms of building their livelihoods. How do you create income for people? Because I was a survivor, you know. When you're a hustler, then you know what people really want, you know. That, that, that's, that's the thing. 
And uh, for me now, striving hard in life and making sure, building who I want to be in future, then I started now working with people in terms of like, how do they create income for themselves? Like in, we call it income generating activities. We, so I, I started working with organization in terms of building livelihoods. So I went back to Somalia. I always traveled in Kenya, Somalia. Then I worked with them for, it's, it was a French organization by the name, Agency for Technical Cooperation and Development. It's called ACTED. It's based in, in Paris. So, but they work internationally. So they work like around more than 50 countries in the world. So that's where I started working. I started learning people who, who work from different countries, people from UK. I had a boss from UK. My boss was, was called uh, Catherine Hingley. So she, she was my line manager. I worked with her for, for two years. And, and uh, you know, out of that now, I learned like what my place was. I went back to Somalia. I went back to where we originally came from. And you know, you'll, you'll, you'll understand like when a country had civil war, you'll, you'll see all the, the, the aspects of like the effects of the war in terms of like demolished houses, you know, you'll hear of several people died in this number of days, you know, you'll hear of people suffering from uh, hunger, you know, and even some, some areas there, there's no social facility. You'll even understand like when you're traveling out, the roads are very rough. You can spend more than, let's say, that's like more than 20 hours in, in 70 kilometers road, which is 70 miles. You know, for you to cover 70 miles, you spend 20 hours. It's like everything is hooked up from here. Sometimes you, you might even push the car because you cannot, you cannot drive it to do the holes. So you'll understand, so you'll say that this is, these are the effects of the, of the war in this, in, I mean, in, in, this part, in, in all parts of the country. So and then again, out of that now, uh, during this period, which I didn't say that, I moved from the refugee camp in the year 2000, and eight by the end of 2008 and 2010 uh, I, I I got married I got married to a girl from UK, from US she, she lived in Arizona Phoenix but I knew her family we knew each other then we started like we talked and the family agreed then she traveled back after she got her passport she brought back to Nairobi we met we had our wedding there then I had my first born in, in Arizona because she, they came back when she was like six months pregnant. Then she, we got a baby girl. So I have my first daughter, Sudi, who was born in Arizona. And then, so how I moved in after working with organizations for like seven years in different capacities. Then my, we, my wife came back again in 2013 to Nairobi again. We stayed. Then she got pregnant. And when she got a baby boy this time. So... After we got the second born, then we, I thought like my wife really needs my help now because we have a number of children and she's the one taken care of. So I decided with her now that we have to, I have to move with them. So I have to be with them instead of living alone. So that's how she, she applied a visa for me. I went to all the processes. It took, it's a long, very long process. You and if, when, when you get a visa from you and it's really very, very strict and it's a, an entire long process. So I went all the processes, filling out papers, doing interviews from one interview to another, you know. So I, they did all, all background checks who I am and everything. Then I brought all the forms they need from me. And so at the end of 2000, I mean, in the middle of 2014, around July, then I got my visa. Then in 2000 and, and, and for within 2014, by September, I moved in. So, so I travel, you know, it wasn't, it was like, for me, moving from Somalia to a refugee camp, and then moving from a refugee camp to a bigger city, which is in, in Kenya. Then moving from now the bigger city to, 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 to years now. It was, uh, there's another challenge, and uh, you know, I, because I, I used to travel you know, through uh, uh, aeroplane, which is flights, I had flights. You know, whenever I traveled to Somalia, I used to have like, flights from Kenya to Somalia, and then some areas I went, then there's no flight, then I have to travel on road. So, I mean, by road. So all these things it was, was really some experience for me, too. So I travel like 20, 20, 27 hours from Nairobi to Sembal in Minneapolis. So, I mean, in Sembal. So, so that's the way I, I moved to. And it was really a, very experience for, a good experience for me. I came in. It's a new life. New people. You know, it's like, again, a different weather. Totally different. You know, very cold. Very cold. And then I came on, just, just like it was on sep in September. I came on 3rd of September, yeah. So, and then 
then the winter started around by October. So that was another experience again. So yeah, I, my, my wife was like, she lived here for like more than 10 years and it was easy for me like to go to wherever I want because she was the one who was driving, you know, she takes me to new places, go to like places like Walmart, you know. So with all this, then I started now going into getting my social security, getting my green card, you know, with all this process and, and everything went well with me. Then now a new life now, I started now, I had some background in terms of driving. Uh, I learned in, you know, yeah, I was driving in Kenya, but I didn't drive my own car, but I, I learned like I paid driving school and I was able to drive. Then here now it's just like, but we didn't have all these lights, you know. For you now, this I-94 where you have like a bunch of trucks and everything, it was really another, you know, I wasn't sure of myself, you know, I was like, can you drive to this road, you know? Mm -hmm. Whenever she drives me, I look at it, I look down and look like, oh my God, what have you got down all this the way, you know? So all these things were there, the fear was, was just there too. So then when it came in, you know, for me now, having... You know, in between, like before I left, I, I, I started now enrolling myself in, in, in an undergraduate level school, which I went to Mount Kenya University. I started learning. Uh, I, was, I did, like my associate, the way I said was social work, but this time I did development studies, development studies, which, which covered on, it's not like development studies here in years. Development studies in, in third world countries where people talk of like community development, sociology, social work, and you know, it, it compasses of several units. So they call it development studies because that's what I studied. And I did like, I was a third year student before I moved two years. So when I came here, one thing, I had a goal. And my goal was not to give up my education. Because I always looked at education as the only ticket to wherever I want to be and whoever I want to be, you know? So when I came in, then the first thing I thought was like, how can you go into a school? How can you even finish your undergraduate? So I came in, I looked at schools, I started searching schools through the internet. Then one of the schools that my house caught, my, my, my eyes caught was uh, MSUM. So Minnesota State University in Moorhead. You know, I looked at, and I lived in Pelican Rapids. That's where I started life. So, and this is the nearest school that I could even drive, you know, and, and all these things. So then, out of that, I came into the admission department one day with my wife. I asked them questions. I brought in all my certifications and everything. Then they said, like, we cannot evaluate all these credentials. We want you to go to and seek a third party evaluation company which can evaluate your credentials. Then there's, there's the West, Western Education System, which is one program which also does evaluation. And then they have the ECE, which is Education Credentials Evaluation. So I looked at the, the education evaluation credentials. I sent, I talked to them. They asked me to pay like 200 something dollars, 240, I think. Then I and then they, they were asking like my original transcript and everything. So I sent all the information to them. They went back to, they communicated back to where I, where I stated all the, and then they, they, they changed all my credentials to the US system. So I, then I came back, I thought of what to do. You know, I did development studies, but then there's no development studies here. This development studies is like we're talking about the industrial world. So which is totally different, far apart from whatever I learned. So and then I looked at my own, I, I, I searched like what other programs they have. Then the uh, sociology department was something that interested me more because I'm a man of society. You know, I worked with society. I know what, who people are, you know, and that really attracted me more to the course then. Then, and with social work, the difference was like, Whatever I do is more based on research thing. And uh, social work was very specific. And sociology is just like a very wide field where you can, you can do whatever you want. Then that's why I went into the social department. And then I had like more like they considered me more like at associate level, you know, where I, I have like two years and I need two years to finish. So I'm still in school and hoping to finish by May 2013, 2017. So that's, that's where I started. And then one other, you know, when, when you come to new places, one, one thing that you learn is the, you know, the culture of people. And then the weather was another thing. You know, well, for me, having like very heavy clothes, jackets, you know, the way we dress here now during winter, was really something strange. Whatever we had, you can wear suits, yeah, when you have like some, some sort of, when you have a party or you have invitation or anything, or when you're doing like office work. 
but heavy jackets and boots and you know those things were not there we I used to have like sandals very open shoes you know so and then that was one thing and uh, and then the first challenge I had when I f you know I I looked for a job and when I started looking for jobs I, I started like applying online I didn't go to any human service jobs but I did the starting like looking at the online the websites of all organization and I started looking for jobs and the first job I got was with Target store with Target store they employed me as their sales their sales sales floor team member and uh, which sometimes you have to go to the cashier stand there for like eight hours and you know that was really tough for me the first job I had like, for me Standing eight hours wasn't something that I'm, I'm used to, you know. Where I, I, I worked, I worked at an, an office, so it was, it was hard. And uh, I started working with them for like, and whenever, you know, people interview me, they ask me questions related to whatever I did. And everyone will ask me like, why didn't you go to Lutheran Social Services? Why didn't you go to any human service job, you know? Of which I say like, I have no, I have, I have no idea of what they do here. So I have to learn them, you know. It's like, I started working with Target. I learned, I learned people, you know, and uh, with that now, it, it, it opened doors for me. Then I started now looking, because for me, one easy thing was what really helped me was my communication skills, where I was able to communicate English in English, you know, I was able to speak with people, and that, that really helped me. Then I started now job in, jobs like uh, customer care jobs, you know, it, it, it trained me more. I worked with them for some time, then I went to customer care jobs with, with several organizations. And uh, it, it was on. And one experience I had was one of the nights, uh, it, you know, I was working in Fargo Falls, Fargo Falls, which, and then I lived in Pelkara, which is 27 miles, I think around 27. So what happened was, you know, after I, I'm done with the job, I punch out. When I went to my vehicle, it couldn't even start. And it's around 10 p.m., you know. And, uh, this, and it was snowing. I don't know any person yet. I'm not very familiar with all guys. I can't call my wife in Pelicana because she doesn't have any ride again. You know, I, I didn't leave, left any other vehicle at home, so it's like, it's tough. So then I thought about it. I just sat in the vehicle. I said, like, this is a new experience. You moved all the way around, and here is, like, a different experience. <laughs> Your vehicle can't stop. What do you do? And I didn't know even the issue of like jam. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about it. Then I went back to the store. I talked to the supervisor. I said, "This is the problem I have. What do I do?" And then just like one of the staff volunteered, and he said, "Like, Abdi, I want to help you." And then I was like, "Okay, please." And then he brought in the jam. He started my car, and I drive home on that day. And uh, in the morning when I came to work, and then I requested like if my supervisor could put me on a day shift, then a night shift, because I'm like new, a stranger to everything. And it was really tough. It was the first experience, and uh, it, 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 I know I started like learning out of experiences. And I went on and on. And one of the things that I learned when I, as I live here is like the issue of, you know, the culture is totally different. Like the issue of eye contact. Mm -hmm. For us, where I came from, we don't look directly to the eyes of our parents, like or any elder person. We respect people. We usually bow our hand to them whenever they greet us, instead of shaking directly with them. You know, which is now in years of like, if somebody doesn't even shake well, it's like this person's not fine. You know, that's 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 like that's something totally different. And I was like, whenever I looked at people, they look me directly. Uh, when when I don't look directly, people might consider like, why is he not looking at you? You know. Or which they may consider to be like disrespectful, you know, which which to me it's like out of respect. Mm -hmm. That's one thing like I started talking to people and teaching them about sometimes when whenever I have like the the host community, whenever friends, like white guys or any other people who grew up here, I always tell them about like that's what we do. And then our women even don't shake hands unless they, they stretch out and then you want to shake them. Some some of them I for me like I shake them but some people don't shake. Mm -hmm. So with all these cultures, then it's like out of uh, the, 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 the sociology that I do and, and whatever experience I had, like even here in Mohead schools, then I talk to people. I like sometime we had a panel discussion and we were telling them about who we are and, and what we usually do and, you know, about the, what are the, the cultural norms, you know, what are the do's and the don'ts in the school and all these things.
like now my daughter my daughter can speak uh, some somali but not as as, as we speak as right. parents but my sons like they have problem with with, with both language okay. they they speak more uh -huh. in english mm -hmm. than in, in, in because that's the the setup they are in they are with mm -hmm. people they they watch like movies and i mean uh, cartoons yes. and all these things are in english mm -hmm. so it's like but i always try to speak with them in english when they are someone and i ask them to practice Somali when they are in, in this, I mean, I mean to practice Somali when they are at home and then practice English when they are at school and they, they speak with the other kids. So, but I know, you know, like, and then that's, the, here is where they call home again, you know, and, and I always tell them, like, we may have different homes, you know, <laughs> this is where we all belong to now, mm -hmm. yeah. My, my, uh, the reason I ask that is because my, my grandparents were German. Wow. And I can't speak any German, and I regret that. Exactly. That that my family didn't keep the language alive at all. And, and so then, and then the other thing, the other thing that like I I learned is, you know, when when you speak three or two different languages, um, is you may have like a lot of words than another person. In terms of the, you know, in one language, in terms of let, let's look at the some of like words like proverbs. You might have like some Somali proverbs which does not there, which are not there in English, and you might come up with your own interpretations, and that sometimes makes me like sometimes I may interpret things, not the concept of English, but the concept of either Swahili or or, or Somali. So that uh, that also makes any person to have like a strong perception, or whatever you want to say. Yeah. yeah, I found it to be really strange to have like different languages. I think that's, that's a very good question. And it's like, you know, one thing that we need to know is depending on which color we have, you know, whatever color you have, we all have the same blood, right? And all the blood, our, all our blood are red, red in color, right? So it's like whatever needs you have is the same thing. What I want to tell my neighbors and any other person I work with or any other people in the society is like, our similarities are far more than our differences. The pigment of our color might be different, but whatever I share, whatever we share in common, overdoes whatever we, we don't have, like we don't share. Like I may not speak the same dialect that you speak, or I may not pray even the same way you pray to God, but we all pray to the same God, mm -hmm. you know? So we have like a lot of common things, you know, and those, and that's what we need to look at, you know, in, 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 you don't consider like the color of the person or the, the particular nationality of that person, but the most important thing is to consider what the unique talent that person has, what can I contribute to this society, that's the most important thing, and having like one thing I know, and I really appreciate like the forefathers of this country, is like, yes, is, 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 is a very, uh, uh, it's an immigrant, you know, it's an, an entire immigrant population, but that does one. And the second thing is, is like all these people, with, they came with different talents. They came with different background. And that's why U.S. moved far more than any other country in terms of progress, right? So, and that's what we need to look at, you know. And then these young uh, uh, children who are born here and those who are born, uh, you know, in other countries, they are different. But each of them can contribute something different. That's why they're different. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to be proud of. And, 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 and that's what we need to look at. We need to impress diversity and, and inclusion. Mm -hmm.